Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramp, here to usher you in into the weekend. It is first Friday, so I have all your art guide for the downtown Missoula area. I've got a brand new dub and stuff from the 1952 movie, Lone Shark. I also got plenty of other city council stuff that we'll be talking about. we got a short city council meeting, but we have a lot to talk about, as uh, Mayor Jordan Hess uh, uh, is pushing harder to uh, uh, approve of the... Uh, purchase of the Sleepy Inn Motel, which will be uh, deemed for the construction in the, in, in the, within the next year. So uh, moving that and moving forward. So one of the big things that are happening in the news today is that uh, uh, Missoulian and many other publications across the state of Montana are asked to take a two-week furlough of unpaid leave. So uh, this is part of Lee Enterprises uh, cutting back and they have struggled financially in recent years. They rearfully cuff the staff by 10%. Um, in 2022, um, you know, you'd probably heard stories about many other organizations that are cutting back on their staff as well from Washington Post, which announced there's just in time for Christmas. Uh, when reached for comment, Lee Enterprises Re Regional Local News Director David McCumber said he know, uh, he could know, not comment on the situation. I'm sure he's just as uh, blindsided as the, uh, the folks that are working there. So the Missoulian and those folks had to cut back uh, their staff by 10%. Uh, Lee Enterprises uh, takes over 70 publications owned by Lee Enterprises and over 20 are uh, television broadcast stations as well. And I was watching a podcast recently and many people are, uh, you know, kind of disgusted uh, about the attempts of uh, getting readership back in terms of subscriptions because that's where a lot of them got their bread and butter if they couldn't get the uh, advertising funding with that. So, you know, you'd, you'd get these uh, prompts and this promo saying that is like, read the New York Times, we're going to bring Trump down and speaking truth to power, that kind of stuff. You know, all the buzzwords and all that kind of thing. Uh, journalism as a product, which and for many mainstream sources, you know, like even if, if you were to really look at journalism and break it really down, it's basically you're paying somebody to gossip about uh, something and then eventually got more and more a little bit more you know with print journalism and using that to kind of speak truth to power and be like hey you know did you know that the king is taking uh, more than enough taxes than he needs and then you know those kind of things kind of happen and, and it, it really it's the, it's the point of like garnishing information stuff like that but with cable news is just as well uh, protected as you know shows like mine because they're cable news and cable television because financially as long as they have cable subscriptions the person who just uh, gets cable to watch ESPN Sports is uh, indirectly paying for both CNN and Fox News respectfully uh, the extra commercials for the or corporate incentive model which goes gets a hardline sponsorships that these organizations have built their media empires by so you know you've had your basic cable news kind of thing and then they have the additional advertisement sales on top of that, bringing them to that kind of concept of what they have been become. Um, when Giants Rule, which is a great book uh, about Park Row, aka News Row, as the, in the turn of the 20th century and had a lot of cable news. It became really big, really fast, a lot of personalities. You'd have publications sending newspapers across the world, New York Times, uh, Sun Times, all sorts of Times and Globe and all that kind of stuff. It's worth a read and it followed uh, the great times of being a journalist and the worst times as well. We've, uh, we have the uh, concept of fake news, and back then it was the concept called yellow journalism. Media, of course, uh, make uh, news based on getting eyes on screen, and similar independent models have been growing slowly and have been able to uh, go toe-to-toe -to, -toe to viewerships alone. YouTube as a market is, a, uh, is like completely an open. Uh, you know, there's, there, there are some issues with YouTube going on back and forth with uh, monetization and everything like that. But if you have a solid diversity of channels there, you can really uh, uh, get some free entertaining stuff that also can be informative. So I'm a big advocate for uh, independent YouTube and all that kind of stuff. And most independent publications kind of really started out small and everything like that. But then with this whole new corporate model, it's like if you have a small independent uh, organization and then there's always going to be a higher chance that a larger corporation is going to get it because they see that there's some uh, uh, money going into it because you have the people whose eyes are on that so you're not only just buying the publication but you're uh, inadvertently buying the eyes that are on that screen so in many ways independent journalism is a way for a lot of people to uh, see be like okay so a lot of people are actually paying attention to this kind of stuff even though we've kind of ignored a lot of this stuff especially in terms of like union news uh, the Ohio derailment which kind of was almost getting kind of swept under the rug until like local journalists over in East Palestine Idaho really kind of 
kicked up the gear and everything like that. And even more news on that, uh, just recently the uh, U.S. Congress decided to be like, okay, we're going to do some things, we're going to improve some regulations, we're going to put it to a vote. You know, there's a couple of, of bad actors, of course, being like, okay, let's, let's slow your rolls. We're going to do everything we can to kind of clean up East uh, Palestine and do all that kind of thing. And so there's a lot of back and forth. You know, we go deeper and deeper, but we're, we're, let's jump back into Montana for right now. And we're going to talk about the legislation session, which uh, recently, uh, I believe actually today or maybe last Friday, actually, no, no, it was last Friday, that the legislature will not be taking any new bills or any new things. So right now, this is the time in which all the, all the bills that were being contested by Missoula and many other more uh, left-leaning progressive towns are being a little bit more concerned about some of the restrictions that uh, the state is putting down on the, well, first and foremost, it's the ban on banning, which has to do with the 2021 initiative uh, session in which uh, the state doesn't allow for municipalities like Missoula and other cities to uh, ban certain things. And that's why Missoula was very much like, we got to repeal this so we can put a ban on plastic. So, you know, coming off of Lakshmi's concern, the Montana legislature have met with a lot of cities like Missoula and Bozeman asking for, to regain control when banning things, and in Missoula's case, plastics, to avoid going into the landfill. This is just the tip of the iceberg as the one size fit all philosophy won't work for long, uh, some believe. Um, uh, quote, the Montana GOP uh, does not support local control in Montana, said Senator Mar uh, Marilyn Marlar of Missoula. They claim to support small government and local decision making, but if you consider their position on uh, local health boards, tax policy, and now trash management, they want Helena to make all the decisions. This article came out of Missoula, Missoula Current last Monday, but Mo like Missoula, like Bozeman, is an ever-growing city trying to expand services to make sure board and staff can keep up. The issue in this case is regulation of single-use uh, plastics or the lack of it. Staff Amendment had introduced House Bill 413, which would have repealed House Bill 407 called Ban on Banning. Uh, overall, you, uh, when you ban anything without proper studies and impacts to communities, it becomes increasingly hard to repeal those by, uh, through a biannual uh, governmental capacity in which our state of Montana, like I mentioned last, uh, last week, is that Montana is one of four states, including Texas, that only meets on a biannual basis. Um, on the environmental front, a Montana study found that microplastics now infest roughly 90% of Montana waterways conducted by the Environmental Montana and a team of the University of Montana interns. The study tested 50 waters across the state and all but few turned up positive uh, for plastic fibers, filaments, and film. So much that the rainwater has been able to carry plastic fibers, making it a part of our ecosystems. Of course, it's been, uh, um, and so that's kind of moving there. And a little bit more of a history lesson, this is, has to do with more of the kind of the Midwest section, but it's been 50 years since the Wounded Knee occupation. A group of natives from the Sioux tribe attempted to overthrow the tribal government and held 11 people hostage for an occupation that started with 200 and ballooned to about 400 within days of ocu occupying Pine Ridge Reservation. This was basically <coughs> back in the uh, 1969, you know, a lot of those protest years, uh, anti-war, a lot of moving forward, there's a lot of organizations coming forward, Black Panthers, a lot of these uh, groups uh, coming around and being like, hey, you know what, I want to speak truth to power, I want to make people listen to us. And for between 69 and 73, you know, the Native Americans uh, through this organization called AIM uh, basically took over uh, Alcatraz back from like 69 to 71. Um, and then it only really got some more national attention as they occupied uh, a church in uh, South Dakota. The apocalypse attracted uh, wide media coverage, especially after the press uh, accompanied two U.S. senators from South Dakota to Wounded Knee. The events of Fried Native Americans and many Native American supporters traveled to Wounded Knee to join the protest. At the time, there was widespread uh, public sympathy for the goals of the occupation as Americans were becoming more aware of the long-standing issues of injustice related to Natives. Uh, and so moving on, uh, let's see. Okay, so a trust of sort, uh, as Missoula looks into the housing trust to help people afford to buy their home on land controlled by government agencies. The Northside Scott Street neighborhood is being made with uh, this in mind along with NeighborWorks, 
which has been buying land in trailer slash mobile home type neighborhoods as well. And of course, I'll talk more about this during my city council, but uh, the report as they aim to buy Bonnie's Place trailer park. But I watched it and it was pretty much straightforward as they ended up voting for moving forward with the purchase of this. This is about $180,000 of the uh, uh, the affordable uh, land, uh, the affordable uh, housing trust fund committee. Uh, in which you know they the, any kind of extra surplus or any th sales of property and thing like that, the, a lot of that money goes into this particular uh, uh, lump sum of money. Uh, more, of course, uh, more related to Missoula news as well is that our police chief uh, Jason White will be retiring soon. So earlier this week, Chief uh, announced um, his retirement after three years of b being Missoula's chief of police and 34 years of total service. He will retire by the end of this month, by the end of March. Uh, as we get deeper into the weeds of the Ohio train derailment, contrast to Elberton train derailment rings deep in many small towns affected by chemical spills. Uh, MCAT's very own Ron Show wrote a book uh, on it, literally. The book is called Gassed, and here is the synopsis. The spill revealed the 1996 crisis of town folk fleeing the toxic fog and ensuring struggle to patch uh, the largest ever breaching of liquid chlorine tank. Hundreds of people experience acute injury with one immediate death. Uh, R.L. Scholl uh, documents the uh, catastrophe of a mixed chemical spill, which raised con uh, critical questions about the emergency response and the controversies that divided the community. This riveting case study illuminates the physical, psychological, and financial devastation of the toxic magic exposure, which could happen anywhere, anytime. And so, you know, I mentioned this because Missoulian wrote an article about the Alberton derailment uh, in contrast, but with the recent events coming around, we've updated this to include the truth behind the inevitable nature of train derailments in these times. Uh, one of the staff members of the library was a child of Elberton, and his mother is very prominent in the book and lives in the folks of the area. He's been dealing with thyroid problems and many other medical concerns are just one of many people out of Elberton. And uh, Libby Montana is a prime example that took advantage of a Brownfield and Super Sun fight to get universal health care uh, uh, as a vermiculite mine had spread deadly airborne asbestos, killing hundreds and sickening thousands in Libby in northwestern Montana. The W.R. Uh, Grace Company that owned the mine denied its connection with the massive levels of mesothelioma, asbestos, and dodged responsibility for this environmental and health disaster. When all lawsuits and legal avenues failed, Bacchus turned to our country's single-payer plan, Medicare. Senator Max Bacchus at the time from the other industrialist countries have uh, found that the cover uh, everyone for the less uh, they must remove the profit-making insurance companies. Um, Congressman John uh, Conyers of, has reintroduced uh, H.R. 676, the Expanded and Improved Medicare for All Act, which does exactly that. Um, there are 60 co-sponsors, and this would cover med all medical uh, necessity care for everyone, including dental uh, and drugs by cutting out the 30% waste and profits caused by the private insurers. The concept of a single pay system exists and it's happening in Libby, Montana of all places. And, and it's, uh, you know, it's all, uh, it's all based on the reaction of the uh, ecological disaster that happened after that. So even going so far as the uh, French town community affected by Smurfit Stone, which closed in 2010 and left a, a Branfield site. So uh, MCAT followed the meetings with EPA and staff as they tested the water. But since the pandemic, it seems like many tests haven't been occurring and meetings have stopped being filmed by MCAT a as a result. So there's a lot of uh, things at stake for sure, but I'm going on a major side quest <laughs> with all these old school stories from a small town disasters then don't get as much coverage as they deserve uh, much longer in the after effect. Because, you know, think about it like this. He's like, you have these chemical spills, you have all this stuff that happens. It's like, oh, this is crazy. This is an ecological disaster. But when the cameras leave and everything goes, it's like the people still have to live in the town that, in which that happens. So that's one of the things that, you know, like with the stonk, uh, starch contrast, in, in fact, in exactly with the 5,000 residents of East Palestine, Ohio, after getting some Trump water with all the minerals. So you might as well be squeezing rocks out of water. So all the minerals, all the minerals, you know, uh, there's, yeah, anyways, I think the one big thing that a lot of people were really concerned about is that, you know, that there's something, some shady stuff happening when you arrest local uh, news reporters for attending government meetings. Um, and, you know, part of the Open Meetings Act was supposed to be like, hey, when you have these meetings, you're supposed to have it open to the public and you denied a journalist and going so far into arresting a guy, uh, the guy from Palestine, Ohio. So 
folks were told uh, things were getting things were better and that they were hoping to underplay the incident where clearly chemicals spewed in the air contaminating the water. The uh, official estimated 38,000 minnows and around 5,000 other species such as fish, crayfish and amphibians were killed during the derailment. It was very weird from the company doing their own research and saying that none of the fish died and then coming back and being like, okay, maybe we had something to do with it. And then on the other hand, mid-February saw waivers try to convince people to waive their right to sue the company and uh, involved in the EPA adjacent county. So there's a lot of different things. North Fork Southern, uh, the company has told East Palestine to return home last week as they said the air was clean. So there's a lot of things happening in the world and I'm gonna kind of end it right there. Um, I have a new promo for you guys. Uh, this is featuring um, a nice stop animation that I made myself. So I'm just gonna kind of throw it out there. Um, and then also followed by a promo for all our summer camps that are happening most of the month of July and some in August. So without further ado, here's this promo. And when I come back, we're going to talk about some movies. Hey! Hey! It's time for summer in Montana, and why wait when MCAT is offering summer kids programs for the months of July and August? For three weeks, we will bring back our stop animation camps for kids getting used to production and video editing, followed by our horror camp for more advanced filmmakers. But that's not all. I wonder how long he's gonna keep us waiting. Yeah, he just keeps staring out that window. Through these camps, kids will learn how to create stories and bring them to life and make lasting friendships along the way. Let's go! Log on to MCAT.org to sign up or call us at 542-MCAT. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend. We're kicking things off with Creed 3, the movie in which Sylvester Stallone's like, eh, I don't like the producer, so I'm going to skip this movie. So let's, okay, so let's jump right in. Kicking things off, welcome to the rule of thirds when we skip a couple of rehash Rocky uh, Rocky's past with the Russians. Now we get the taste of Clubber Lane type situation of a man stuck in jail and challenging man who has everything. But there's a twist. Um, uh, just making sure my audio is going. But there's a twist. Uh, they're old BFFs, and the one getting out of the jail wants the other guy what the other guy wants, and the other guy versus the other guy, and then this, the stage thing happens, and then they give this guy a chance to fight, but then he's like a real fighter, and he's like, oh no, I, I gotta worry about this kind of stuff. And then, you know, blah, 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 blah. anyways, uh, enjoy a movie that's gonna basically say, like, you know, I don't really watch boxing, but, you know, if you get someone like me outside, remember only who Mike Tyson is. Then you got then you got a problem. So uh, I know that Conor McGregor and Manny Pacquiao are, and I have no idea how I kind of know that from MMA. But you know, skip boxing and invest in mixed martial arts, and perhaps we might see some spillover like in Rocky Three uh, when they had the wrestling uh, scene with uh, uh, Hollywood's Hulk Hogan. Um, next up, we got an anime. Well, why not enjoy some anime? Because anime, anime, anime. Uh, enjoy an anime where a good guy struggles to overcome odds against him, yeah, only to be stuck in the same situation in the next movie. Mm -hmm. Anyways, this anime is a peak um, and has been doing well in uh, the Japanese market, and many American audiences actually like this particular anime known as Demon Slayer, and they're going to be doing the Swordsman Village arc. So if you don't know any of that stuff and you haven't followed any of this stuff, don't worry about it. It's basically a bunch of uh, uh, guys at the turn of the uh, 19th, uh, 18 to 1900s, um, old kind of feudal Japan to modern Japan. There's a bunch of sword fightings, all that kind of stuff. You know, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how this all works out. And you know, usually anime movies that come out are great, but when you ha adapt them into Hollywood, uh, People in, or even even Japanese when they have their own uh, live action uh, an, anime ad, ad, adaptations, like yeah, let's not. So enjoy an actual animation movie rather than an anime adaptation. Adaptation. Uh, up next, we have yes, we have a, yet another one of those kind of uh, movies that are like heist movies. This movie is called Operation Fortune. Nothing gets the uh, uh, boomers to stand up more than a bank heist. Watch Jason Thaisen 
Jason Statham steal money from a place only to get caught and used to steal weapons of mass destruction and enjoy a tone that only Knives Out have created with a sense of interesting characters and an over-convoluted plot that gets kind of uh, plotted through the movie. And just like, it's, it's just a movie, relax. But then they, they build up to a plot that's even more convoluted and it's like, it's just a movie, relax. Like, no, you're, 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 you're introducing a lot of elements and you expect us to pay attention to a lot of these elements and then you just kind of shoehorn a bunch of scenes and be like, remember this scene? Boom, we're smart. No, it's it's not. It's it's just like, here's a heist movie. Here's all the scene. We know exactly what's happening. It's kind of like the concept of a Sherlock Holmes is like, Sherlock Holmes would not exist in real life. You just know it because it's like he has access to the book uh, that he's that's written about him, so he knows exactly what he's doing. So I don't know. That's kind of what, what, what I feel about Sherlock Holmes is like he's just too much of an a know-it-all. Up next, we have a brand new dub and stuff from the 1952 movie. Um, Lone Shark. So here's this. And when I come back, we're going to be talking about some city council stuff that happened uh, within the city of Missoula. Well, hello. We would like two cheeseburgers. Order but for fries. the last time, we were not going to do that what big. Are you some kind of couple comedians. No, we were just supposed to intimidate you and stuff and get you to do things for us. Huh? Oh. Uh, well, what do you have in mind? Well, these two clients... Uh, I must owe you money or something. Please don't interrupt me. But yeah, there are two of them. Yeah, they're having a meal between breakfast and lunch. Like a bunch of savages. Um, so Just eat <clears throat> breakfast or lunch. Don't do the middle thing. You're rambling again. Oh, I'm sorry. Do I make you uncomfortable? Alright. Well, who these guys are. Hey, check this out. It's a rare pog disc. Am I supposed to be impressed with 90s trash? If you knew exactly how much this is worth, it's like $10. Oh, but I do not have the money to spare. <laughs> well, do you mind if I join you guys? I just have a couple questions for y'all. If you don't mind answering them. Well, of course not. Everyone can be a cop nowadays. Well, make kindly to people assume that I'm a cop. <laughs> I like the cut of your jib. Ugh. Who even says that anymore? How dare you say something like that? Why are like people that? so interested in words rather than their input? Ah, uh, yes, you're right. It is a tragedy. You know, I swear I came here or something or whatever. If this was a battle of wits, you'd be in the high school speech and debate team. But please, let's start over. Oh, no, you're not pulling that trick on me. I'm giving you a chance for a clean slate. Don't you want to take it? Or are you just mm -hmm. a little bit... Don't you say Stubborn, it. after oh, all. Oh, you are. How dare you call me stubborn. I'm the most unstubborn person I know. Oh, perhaps. But let's finish this before I lose the accent. Uh, I don't really pick up on accents. I grew up in a province next to England, but we watched a lot of Jean-Claude Van Damme movies. Well, I watched Over the Garden Wall, and I'm now the highwayman. And I like saying that over and over again in my head. Oh, yes, that's an okay show. I was but a wee lad when that cartoon came on the air. Elijah Wood played a very crucial part in that role. He was the voice of a cartoon character. Well, everybody wants to do cartoons, but I'm stuck doing video games, you hear me? Must be long hours. Uh, I'm gonna put on a tightly it's hard with bubbles on him. I could have said it better myself, chap. I don't hate to hustle, but I do hate the game. It's very hard to get into that voice acting. You have to start off doing mediocre crap. Right here? Don't test me. Because we're all striving to be something more than we are. Something better. Something pure. Hey guys, welcome back. Let's jump right into some city council reports. So uh, there's not much to say in terms of a public comment. Uh, it was about a pretty short meeting, but of course, before we started the city council report, I want to give a shout out to Missoula Asian Services and their annual March for Meals event, which is a fundraising campaign campaign to support Meals on Wheels program. The Meals on Pro Wheels program are uh, are a daily uh, food delivery service for f folks who are aging and are also homebound. It's to kind of help alleviate their uh, trip to the 
the supermarket and also just be able to bring uh, nutritious food directly to them, especially on Friday where they have extra meals so they can last them through the weekends. It's a great service for many aging adults and those who care for them. Most of these services are through Missoula Aging Services at MissoulaAgingServices.org. For the rest of the meeting, we're playing catch-up with Monday's holiday with plenty of bills and recurring payments to the city operation. Uh, but the meeting turned out to be only about an hour long. I mean, a couple of the uh, library uh, of the um, staff were just like, okay, now we're going to have to play some catch-up and stuff like that. But, hey, they managed to pull it out. And um, uh, through, like I said before, the Bonnie's Place, the Trailer Park Mobile, ho uh, mobile Court, where a uh, housing trust fund wants to invest in $180,000 towards putting, being able to uh, have the folks in Bonnie's Place retain their homes by helping them buy the land from under them. Closest thing that many folks will get to home ownership at this point. Uh, Emily Harris Shears, uh, housing and community specialist, talks about this particular topic um, a little bit more. Uh, this is in partnership with the residents who've identified that they would like to go through the process of converting to a resident-owned community, which means they will collectively own the land on their mobile home community um, and you know, have more access and stability in their housing. So um, as I shared in the memo in the staff report, um, we staff feel that there's urgency to secure this funding um, outside of the competitive application round that's going on now. We won't have applications scored and finalized by the time their um, closing date comes up on March 21st. And so we're going to need to work really quickly on contracting and getting um, this kind of solidified if approved. All right, so you know they're just kind of moving forward. They're definitely worried about us uh, because they're spending pretty much most of the money that they have uh, already acquired through the trust fund. Um, so Emily talks about the depletion of the fund for this and uh, some of the reason behind this purchase. The staff perspective, as well as some of the conversations surrounding the oversight committee, is that the funding is intended to be used and intended to be used for projects that would otherwise uh, negatively impact people in our community and their housing stability. Um, and so our recommendation is to fund this at the full request as it um, otherwise will not meet the program's need. Okay. And so this is a, one of many other th um, or, um, uh, policies moving forward within the city of Missoula seems to be uh, um, gearing towards uh, helping people retain their housing. Um, and I think that's a big thing, especially in Missoula, as we're getting an ever-growing community, not to mention property taxes are going up. Um, and uh, it's so, you know, and so far these are uh, tools in place to tap into a competitive bids upwards of nearly $800,000, but that money is not ready available at this particular time. The council moved forward with this process and uh, now uh, we're moving on to the Mullen Build Project, which has a one snag in the developing their new uh, neighborhood's infrastructure, and that had a lot to do with water and sewer. And so the city of Missoula and the Missoula Water Company had to uh, deal with uh, a new plans and trying to figure out, it's like, okay, how do we lay these costs? How do we uh, do these kind of things? Let's work with the developer. And so a good chunk of the developer will be taking uh, some um, more uh, more of a hit just to develop the infrastructure that is water and sewer. Logan McGinnis with engineer for the Missoula Water talks a little bit more about that. And this is what he had to say. So the bill grant did not include any funds to pay for utilities. You know, those obviously needed to be installed prior to building streets. So the city agreed to bridge the gap to finance the installation of the utilities until a latecomer fee could be collected from the developers. So about a year ago on April 11th, the council approved preliminary fees in Public Works, we agreed to bring final fees after construction had wrapped up. And so now utility construction is complete and now the fees have been finalized. And, you know, these fees, there's a total of 10 properties subject to these fees and, and the fees have increased at two of those properties and decreased at, at eight. Okay, and the big uh, big chunk of the reasoning behind the uh, decrease and increase is that uh, one the, the two... Uh, uh, units of the 10 are bigger and they want more uh, water infrastructure to for their uh, the large facility. Logan went into more details on why, but the two properties request additional water hookups on la larger sections, so the end of the smaller section reduces in price as a whole. So it's still affecting the 10 um, basic areas, the 10 units that they're going to be building on this site, but the total costs include 
$2.6 million for water, $1.3 million for sewer, which will be financed through revenue bonds. Legislative update, so far any new bills are being introduced as a last Friday and the end of the hearings in Montana's legislature have wrapped. Jessica, Mayor, Jessica Miller, Office of the Mayor, gives an update on reports and hearings about you know, any kind of future new bill introductions and stuff like that. So we're kind of at the uh, tail end of the uh, legislature session. So this week, um, the big hearings are, um, we have Senate Bill 374, which is revised local government public document retention. Um, the wonderful Ms. Uh, Trimble is handling the meeting today because the wonderful Ms. Rabine went to Helena to speak in that committee. And um, I hear that that hearing went pretty well this afternoon. So um, we're hoping that that one that helps us clean up some of our, our records and our document retention and streamlines that process and removes some of the bureaucracy. We're hoping that that one will go through pretty well. And we have a couple of staff testifying on some uh, landlord and, and renter bills tomorrow, um, which is uh, Senate Bill 476 to prohibit housing discrimination based on the source of income and House Bill 785, which will revise landlord tenant laws to require 60 days notice to changes for those who have a lease that's longer than month to month. So we've got staff testifying on both of those. Okay, so just a couple of those uh, uh, updates as well. Um, so far, the Missoula has a very steep uphill battle when it comes to curving policy and making it easier to serve Missoulians. Uh, from last Friday's media, media has spoken length about the uh, constant growth in our property taxes and the state legislature blocking any ability to mitigate tourism tax or any kind of state tax, which unfortunately, you know, when you say the word sales taxes, might as well be a... Uh, 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 final nail in your co political coffin in the state of Montana. So that's the state uh, legislature blocking any ability to get uh, to uh, kind of create a local gas tax in which Missoula tried to do a couple of years ago. Uh, state and federal take money from your income and local is property taxes. Revenue is pretty much streamlined and not much room for crossover. Uh, Jessica also talks about the flurry of bills that some passed and others were tabled at that particular time. So here's Jessica Miller talking about some of those uh, bills. Bill 465, which revises local government acceptable use of building permit fees. We supported that one. That one did pass out of committee, gives us a broader use of what we can, um, a, a longer use of what we can use those building fees for, as well as um, a broader use. Uh, House Bill 369, the growth policy referendum, that one was tabled. House Bill 413, which would have allowed us to regulate plastics at a local level, that one was tabled as well. House Bill 324, which was the local government expenditure limitation, uh, that one would have been extremely challenging for us, uh, for all municipalities in Montana to overcome, and that one was tabled, thankfully. Um, House Bill 337 would have decreased our minimum lot sizes in the city. We couldn't have a minimum lot size over 2,500 square feet. That one was tabled. Okay. And so the, just a, kind of like a, a basic overview of a lot of the bills that are happening in Congress. And, you know, uh, SB uh, 245, which is a major bill that would have un, um, restricted size and multi-dwelling commercial slash business areas, which in turn would allow for very large and tall buildings in Missoula. However, local communities will still be able to have input on this particular bill, which is still on track for passing. Jordan Hess, mayor, talks about the Sleepy Inn and comments from the mayor, and he uh, just wanted to uh, clear the air on uh, the reason behind the purchase of the Sleepy Inn even more so. The construction of that property has begun, and that's an effort to salvage building materials and divert construction waste from the landfill. That's something that we uh, do quite regularly now, and it's um, something that's in service of our zero waste goals. Um, that Sleepy Inn property unequivocally saved lives and made the city money, and um, anything contrary to that is false information. We paid $1.1 million for the building. During that time, we were reimbursed $1.9 million for FEMA, from FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, for our expenses. Uh, and we, in addition to that, received $718,046 in rent. Um, we are, in the next week or two, listing that property for sale for $890,000. Uh, so the $1.9 million in reimbursements was reimbursing costs, but the $718,000 in rent 
plus the $890,000 uh, in sale in listing price is over four, over five hundred thousand uh, dollars in excess of the original purchase price. So we will make money on that property, and um, that is uh, the plain truth of it. Okay. And so you know he he went into a little bit more detail about how a lot of this money would go into the affordable housing trust fund. Um, you I know, mean, this also reminds me of the uh, the uh, prosperous times of the University of Montana, where President Denison, former uh, University of Montana uh, leader, who used the university uh, resources to buy land in and around the university, bringing it to prosperity well into the 2010s. But I understand if you know the city concept of city-owned property means like, do you want the government to own your property? Uh, but then on the other hand, you, the banks ba technically own your property and you're mortgaging out it, to it as well. So there's there's a weird kind of a um, catch-22 situation. It's like, do you trust uh, the banks more than the government? Or do you want, like, I don't know. It's, it's kind of weird. I don't want to get into it. Okay, moving on. Jordan has talks about the sale and the West Side master plan in this particular area because is, it isn't just about the sleepy end. It is about the... Uh, the blight um, and just improving the whole uh, west side uh, neighborhood area uh, Broadway corridor. So this is what uh, Jordan has had to say. That will yield a an opportunity to redevelop the site um, and um, increase the tax base and promote city objectives. So that could be housing, it could be mixed use, it could be commercial. Uh, but whatever it does, it'll be in service of the West Broadway Community Master Plan, which will create a new, which calls for creating a new neighborhood center in the area. Uh, it calls for services that the West Side neighborhood um, has asked for for a long time: local businesses, childcare, other types of of services that are that are neighborhood oriented. And um, it calls for redeveloping a uh, relatively blighted area on West Broadway into a more vibrant area. Yep, and you know, most of the sites was just kind of like, you know, it's almost impossible to kind of get into those kind of areas because it kind of feels like it's off of a, of a busy street and there's just not much access to just a lot of uh, uh, free and flowing parking overall. So yeah, this is gonna be an interesting um, part of Missoula that's gonna be changing over the next couple of years. And uh, one of the other items they talked about during uh, Committee of the Whole, you know, uh, no matter how you shake it, Missoula's changing and I'm, uh, I'm gonna kind of leave it there. Um, Community meetings covered uh, settings of standard price for the Missoula compost and delegated authority to the director of public works an extension of their job. Uh, this site was formerly Echo Compost and the city moved to purchase this with the property next to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, currently the co uh, compost produces more than they can sell. It is highly, uh, it's a high supply market for anyone wanting to start, <coughs> excuse me, the, their own garden uh, popping. So, you know, compost is plentiful in the city of Missoula and you know, just giving you the uh, the uh, the the fast track into some cheap echo compost. Anyways, um, Scott Street is starting to see better roads and safety associated with the new bustling neighborhoods grown in the area. Sidewalk, a two-way protected bike lane on the west side of the street, roundabouts, turn lanes, crosswalks, street lights, non-motorized connections from Stoddard Street to Scott Street Bridge, traffic calming measures, curb drainage structures, and asphalt resurface are among those plans for this area. New neighborhood. New infrastructure, a bunch of other things happening as well, including that uh, 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 the land, the Scott Street Land Trust, in which this government owns a good portion parcel of land that will be uh, redeveloped for affordable housing and have it kind of uh, uh, fee restricted. I believe it's like 60% the uh, uh, normal area income for Missoulians. So it's going to be a lot of opportunities with that. Another big part was uh, resurfacing of a couple uh, field courts, uh, you know, Maryland Park. Uh, was earmarked for construction and now they've been able to cover additional parts uh, from Franklin to Maryland. They had to drop Skyview Park based on the proposed $350,000 budget. Uh, and when I say budget, budget means that there's money already associated with this to be able to put into this in which they've been waiting for this money to uh, get uh, filled up so they can actually pay for it. So another item was related to, into putting cables alongside East Karis Park. Blackfoot Communications and Access uh, Montana were among the requesters for this particular project. So that'll be happening sometime in the future. Uh, public Safety and Health. Uh, this is talking about the Food Policy Board. And this is also kind of like an announcement moving forward. Uh, I believe it's next week. They're going to be talking about uh, um, basically uh, sourcing the meat and uh, uh, you know, sourcing meat in slaughterhouses and uh, like butchers and all that kind of stuff in the city of Missoula. And so we're gonna jump right in. Uh, uh, Claire Battaglia with the food board gives an update on the general uh, sense of how the food board is going right now. So here's she. 
So one aspect of engaging with the food system that we're always especially interested in is food access. Um, and one of the ways that we measure that is participation in nutrition assistance programs. Uh, so you can see in the graphic on the left there, uh, 292 of our respondents do not participate in any programs um, and 57 do. So that's pretty, um, pretty skewed there. Um, and of the people who do participate in a program, the two most common were SNAP and double SNAP dollars. Um, and then followed by the Seniors Farmer, Farmers Market Nutrition Program and the free and reduced school meals. Um, and one thing that we thought was really uh, interesting and worth noting is that, um, as I'm sure you all know, when someone is eligible to participate in SNAP, they are automatically eligible to participate in double SNAP dollars. Um, it's There's no extra application um, or paperwork. Uh, and you use the same EBT card to, to access both programs. Um, but only 17 of the 44 people who use SNAP also reported using double SNAP dollars. Um, so that's only 39% um, when we would expect that to be, you know, closer to 100%. Um, and All right, so uh, well, the, the, we go more into detail, like I was saying, about the uh, meat packaging. Money was on a lot of people's minds when coming to food to cook versus quick food they can just buy. However, the main issue were, were affordability and insecurity resulting from food access. Many people want to preserve more egg land and be able to encourage more farm-to-table angles. Uh, last time they spoke on the topics was meat and where they come from and how it is processed and sold, sold through Missoula. And it turns out a good chunk of it is actually done in Missoula. There is the there is a, a commute to Kalispell with, when, when it, wrapping up the thing, but um, in terms of a lot of the locally sourced meat, it seems like Missoula is a little bit better than uh, most other communities. So Claire talks about the upcoming meet up, pun intended. Um, we've been working with a student at the University of Montana um, and in sort of spearheading efforts and understanding um, how much need and desire there is for kind of a local processing facility um, that essentially, you know, the farmers in our area would be able to use and, and not have to ship stuff to Idaho and then come back. And um, and so we're having a roundtable discussion. Um, is, Heidi, is that March I may have to pull up the exact date, um, but March like 15th, March I think. March 13th, I believe. March 13th, okay. All right. So, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of what's happening now is that, um, you know, they haven't been able to really kind of meet and do any kind of thing. But, you know, some of the drawbacks from this presentation has a lot to do with the fact that this was made just before the pandemic hit and required immediate need from housing to homelessness, eclipsing everything else in our community. Missoula is still reeling from shutdowns. For more for presentation on this, you can go to the city's uh, website at ci.missoula.mt.us. It is a wonderful website meant to help people just kind of uh, find out what's happening in the city of Missoula. I'll bring up the website right now and kind of tell you exactly how I get uh, my uh, sources and how I get my information from here directly. You go to the uh, ci.missoula.mt.us. I always click on the meetings tab right here because, you know, you want to look at uh, what the city's talking about, all that kind of stuff, and then you scroll down here. <coughs> I personally like the calendar view because you can actually look at the dates associated with the meetings. You know, I'd have to go back to February if I'm going to go to city council meetings, and then you see right here, this is city council in green. <coughs> click on it. I click on the uh, agenda HTML because that also covers the hyperlinks associated with the time code. So what I mean by that, <coughs> as I'm coughing right now, is that every everything that's in blue right here, if you click on it, the uh, time uh, stamp of the meeting goes right to it. And since you know a lot of these are associated with a good chunk of the uh, uh, beginning part, they kind of start at the very top. So if I click on this proclamation, it jumps over to 13 minutes and 45 seconds where they actually talk about that particular topic. So that's pretty much about that. Um, let's see. I do want to throw it over to a fun video for you guys. I, I do need to take a quick break. But when I come back, we're going to talk about some of the art stuff that are happening in and around the city of Missoula. So without further ado, here is a fun little video made by uh, Josh Cook.
All right, we are back. Sorry about the short delay, but we're going to jump right into your First Friday events that are happening this week as well. We'll kick things off with uh, the first one, Beauty and the Beats. Mixed music with uh, Randy Zelinsky, uh, beats provided by 98's Romanik uh, Moxie Cosmetic Art Studio. This is 134 West Broadway near the Courthouse, FedEx and Kinko's. Then we get followed by uh, Brunch, which is going to be featured at Wildfire Ceramic Studios, a playful approach to physicality and existence. These bodies of work are in con uh, conversation with each other. Similarities in forms and colors introduce connections with nuance with the art within the artist's approach tilt towards a feeling of unease. Kind of like uh, I was feeling just before I got into the segment. So 2502 Murphy Street. This is off-Broadway across from Animals. Uh, then we got Clay Studio of Missoula. They're doing a community exhibition. The popular exhibition showcases the diverse and, and exciting uh, ceramic works created by Clay Studio of Missoula students, members, and studio artists. They'll feature a range of works created by the two dozen participating artists, including but not limited to large sculptures, mixed media pieces, wall works, hand-built vessels, and functional wheel uh, thrown forms. This exhibition will be on display through the uh, month of March. And uh, the opening for it is from 5 to 8 p.m. along with every other thing that's happening in the downtown and Missoula sound surrounding area. Missoula Makers Collective, this is at Matriarch Market in celebration of Women's History Month. Indigenous Made Market Missoula, oh sorry, Indigenous Made Missoula is proud to present Matriarch Market in honor of the Indigenous women in our lives and, and, and our artists slash making maker community. They are excited to be hosted by our friends of the Missoula Makers Collective. And this is at 420 North uh, Higgins Avenue, number B. It's next to Jimmy John's. Um, this next one is actually a part two, has a two-parter thing. This is Sky Above, Earth Below, Radius Gallery off of Higgins. This is a two years after uh, pairing the brilliant bold artwork of Dale Levesey, uh, paintings in oil, and Josh Weasley, ceramics. Radius Gallery is delighted to revisit Sky Above, Earth Below with the new works by these two pre, uh, pr prominent Montana-based artists. Live Z's sculptures, paintings uh, interpret the landscape of our hearts, breathtaking uh, swaths of sky captured, the magical edges of dawn and dusk, allowing us to linger in moments uh, all too fleeting. Dewey's naturalistic color pots assert the uh, gravitas of raw earth in our uh, curated spaces, uh, master of his craft, and advances modernist aesthetic to each functional artwork. Um, here is uh, more in their clay works, in which they're really emphasizing, which will feature world-class ceramics by makers uh, based in Montana and well beyond. The ceramic artists flourish well, fortunate to shine a light in the medium's incredible depth and range. The grand opening exhibit will feature sculptures and pottery by an astonishing array of more than 30 makers. So a lot of different things happening in the downtown Missoula area, happening all from 5 to 8, 8 p.m. every first Friday of the month. And so as we get into the weekend, we have a couple other events that are happening in the city of Missoula which I want to also emphasize. And like always, the library hosts a swath of events like they always do every single week. Storytime and Tiny Tales at 10.30 a.m. on the second floor of the Missoula Public Library help to uh, encourage kids to get into reading and more. Lego Club and D&D &D in the afternoons go well into the weekend with Writers Club for Teams after school. Empower Place, open play hours of the Missoula Food Bank. Missoula Bank is, not, is more than just a food bank, it's a community center, and they are hands-on learning center located at the Missoula Food Bank dedicated to nourishing the bodies and minds of local children and family. One part community center and one part science museum and one part food hub and one part library. There's something for everyone to learn at the Empower Place. Introduction to Pickleball and also continuing Pickleball indoors. Life Learning Center is hitting it hard with Pickleball. Life Learning Center is a great organization for people who want to just kind of like get certified and just learn new things. Um, but you do have to pay for it. Uh, <laughs> The Benevolence at Highlander Beer is going to be kicking things off tonight at 6 p.m. It's going to be a rock jam band. Currents Aquatic Center is doing a swim, adult swim night at Currents starting at 6 p.m. tonight. Life Music with a Strange Time String Band, Cranky Sand Public House playing bluegrass music. Salt and Shadow, Transitional Experience, Sarah Fitzgerald, Dystopian Folk Rock. Salt and Shadow's music has been described as an ethereal and psychedelic, spacious, atmospheric, hypnotic, and haunting. Um, yeah, and that's going to believe it's going to be at the Zach. Uh, Showdown is going to be doing a Sunrise Country Music. So Showdown is going to be playing at the Sunrise Saloon, and they usually play country music. 
If you're interested in doing the Saturday markets and stuff, the Southgate Mall is a great place for your markets and all your needs. Also, Orchard Homes is opening their market, and uh, you guys can check that out. That's just off of 3rd Street um, uh, as you're uh, going down reserve. So, um, family fun time is also happening on Saturday, and this is a great opportunity for kids and families to have some indoor fun and play time at the YMCA. YMCA is always a, a fun place to go, and it's always a cheap membership. Um, uh, Tech Connect with uh, Tech Time at Missoula Public Library. I think this is important. I like to uh, uh, tell people, especially people in the library and folks who are a little bit tech illiterate, um, with a little bit more hands-on help from library staff. Uh, they meet on the third floor of the library every, uh, most Saturdays at 10.30 a.m. and they just kind of help you as you go. They always encourage people to be able to bring their technology because uh, just doing it with your words is not good enough. And I, I always know, like, just from a, my personal perspective, is that a lot of times is that, you know, a lot of people are afraid to make mistakes, so they end up asking more questions just to be like, oh, do I click once? Oh, okay, double click. And then it's like, okay, it's like, it, it's weird. It, there's, there's definitely uh, an interesting barrier there, but I think it's mostly about figuring out how to uh, approach it, kind of like a kid, you know, where you just get hands-on, because, you know, computers are very kind of like hands-on and the only way you can interact is with the mouse. I'm rambling, let's move on. Storytelling at Traveler's Rest. Uh, for more than 30 years, Ellie Nuno has been sharing her energy and in, in, uh, imagination and performance across Western state Montana, Europe, and Asia. Creative style reflects decades of study and performance in the fiddle, violin, encompasses the university range of music from traditional old time and bluegrass to Celtic, Cajun, contemporary rock. It's gonna be a $5 per person. It's gonna be at Traveler's Rest State Park. They have a bunch of other things happening there, but I think this one's gonna be pretty interesting. And then they also have it on Zoom if you can't attend in person. Introduction to Sewing Workshop, Home Resource Community Room. Producers will learn how to uh, operate a sewing machine, practice using scraps to make patches for repair, and use those new skills to create mending bags. So this is at Home Resource, and it's gonna be in their community room. Um, and as always, every Saturday from 1 to 3 p.m., MCAT does our Saturday drop-ins for kids aged 8 to 14. It's a drop-in, it's free, and it's a great way for kids to get involved with uh, stop animation, Rankin Bass, kind of uh, Rudolph kind of thing. They're more than encouraged to bring their own toys, but we have some Legos and some Army Men's and some uh, stick bots and all sorts of different things here as well for kids to use. Um, so that's kind of what happens there. Sound Art, so Missoula Public Library located at the Makerspace from 2 to 4 p.m. This is a free two-part part workshop. Middle school agents will be take a journey through sound waves with Spark. Arts uh, teaching through uh, Jesse Blumenthal using cardboard wires and thin slices of crystals will construct their own sound generating sculptures with which you explore a sonic environment. Resulting works can be uh, used as a DIY microphone for your device, sound triggers for guitar pedals, or noise toys for fun times. This uh, also maker space right after that is doing a sewing and mending starting at 4 p.m. So there's a lot of things happening on Saturday. Saturday seems to be really thick with a lot of events and stuff like that. Not to mention MCAT has our dance party starting at uh, 11 and it seems to be really popping off. A lot of little kids getting out of story time want to get moving and have some fun. And it's a great excuse for a lot of parents to do the club thing uh, without actually having to go to a club. So. Um, revival Comedy, uh, so if you're interested in comedy, Zootown Arts is doing a comedy show on uh, Saturday night at 7 p.m. Also, as the Missoula Symphony Association, they're doing Dynamic Trio. This epic concert showcases the dynamic artists pro, uh, performing the concerto for violin. Um, and this is going to be a Grammy-nominated uh, composer, jazz pianist, uh, Pakel uh, LaBeouf. Works range from modern improvisation music to uh, hybridizing no nota notation based uh, chamber music with production based technology so a lot of things happening this weekend and if you miss this uh, the Saturday night uh, symphony at the University of Montana's Denison Theater you can do it at 3 p.m. Sunday afternoon as well so uh, Monks is doing a cosmic sands Rocky Fall and Western States are gonna be playing some rock music at Monks Solid State Karaoke at the Westside Lanes Fun Center Dakota Poor Men's Sunrise Saloon Country Music Chris Moon is going to be doing some DJ music at the Badlander. And then um, before I wrap up, Sunday, glass recycling. If you have any glass that you want to recycle, Imagination Brewing Company um, is asking for a $1 donation per gallon of glass. And this is going to start at 9 a.m. and it will go on into the afternoon at the Imagination Brewing Company. Um, so, yeah, if you want to recycle glass, is the best time to do it. Um, the Roxy record sale. This is a big sale that's happening at the Senior Center this weekend on Sunday. And so if you have like old vinyl, old music taste collide with the event, this basic swap meet for vinyl lovers, 
donate records. They accept donations for the 2023 Roxy record sale until March 5th. Drop off your uh, gently used media at the uh, Roxy Theater doing business during their business hours. So, uh, yeah, Backyard Chicken Series, uh, MUD in collaboration with the Missoula County Fairgrounds Bluegrass is for a three-part chicken series, three different sessions to uh, kind of um, create uh, a chicken coop and more in raising chickens. Uh, there's more information about this, but I only have a little bit of time. I am going to be wrapping up. And like I said, 3 o'clock on Sunday is also the wrap-up of the symphony for that trio. And uh, I want to thank you guys. And for <laughs> Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Rampo. Hope you guys have a wonderful weekend.